So let's start off by looking at the engine, what's under it, what's all this junk under the hood. I mean, we all know, I mean, we all know that's a battery, right? That's well, the interface. At the top of the motor, you've got older cars have a carburetor right here. This one is kind of a hybrid between fuel injection and um, a carburetor. It, the fuel injection is hidden down inside of it. Um, it's called a spider injection system. You notice the air coming to it comes through this pipe. The pipe leads right over here to your air cleaner box. So that's where the air filter is going to be. Right here on the top. Does anybody know what this is? Trace. This piece here. This is maybe? No, that isn't. Okay, I'll give you a hint. It's got a big electrical wire coming off of it right it's starter. and it's got a pulley that that drives it spark plug so no. No. you're in the right alley it is it is electrical it's, it's the starter it's it's the same system as a starter but it's not the actual starter transmission all right this is your alternator you can always tell an alternator because when you look at it it's going to have an open spot that you can look through and see the little winding there that the electricity is generated in and it's normally got a breather through the front a lot of times when your alternator is not working it's there's a lot of mud and gunk caked up in there you can take contact cleaner or something like that and clean it out you've normally got one connection to the battery you'll notice that this connection to the battery is a ridiculous oversized four alt welding cable that's just so that the power coming into the battery is good and efficient um, this little doohickey right here, I like to call it a doohickey. Um, that's your control for your alternator. Your computer will sense when the system voltage is at like 14 to 14 and a half volts, and it will cut the output of your alternator down. That's your voltage regulator is beneath there. Your alternator basically has that, that winding right there this spinning inside of the winding, you have, you're making an electric field there and it generates not direct current like a battery holds, but it makes alternating current like you get out of your wall. So it's gotta have a voltage regulator to regulate that voltage down to 14 to 15 volts. And then it gets this really cool thing in electronics known as a diode and what a diode does is it keeps electricity flowing one way. So if your alternator is messing up, a lot of times you can pull this plug off and unbolt the little part that plugs into it and replace it and that'll fix your alternator. A lot of people go spend like 200 bucks on a new alternator and what they really needed was like a $12 voltage regulator. So that's one thing. So moving over on the top of the engine there, what about this guy here? It's driven by a belt, except it doesn't have a pulley on the front. It's got something like funky there that has an electric cable attached My to it. My sister almost got hit by that. And it was driving down the road. Did you notice there are two pipes coming into uh, it? Yeah. So it's got two pipes coming into it. The pipes have a bulge on them. If you're familiar with, ooh, that gives away what it is. Any freeze? Any guesses what it is? Uh, pipe. Bulge. All right, so that, that's your air conditioner compressor. Um, this acts as a dryer. That acts as an accumulator in the line. Basically, the line pressure changes if it goes into a bigger size. That's why it's solid metal. And this little pigtail right here, if your air conditioner won't come on, a lot of times you can come out here and unplug that and your air conditioner will come on and stay on. You get worse gas mileage, but your AC works for the meantime until you can top it off. If you want to top off your air, you're supposed to be certified to do any kind of refrigerant work. You take off these caps right here and you hook up Freon and put it in right here. You have any of that? No, nah, because both of these are actually sitting good on that. Moving along, you have most modern vehicles have this right here. 
it's another car doohickey. And if you look, it's it's bolted up right here, and this part right here swivels to keep tension on the belt. You'll notice if I pull on the belt, it actually moves this piece down here. That's what they call a tensioner pulley. That keeps tension on your belt. If you go down the road and you hear your belt squealing, you probably need a new tensioner or a new belt. That's the, that's the tensioner? Yeah. And pretty much every car you're gonna run across now uses this kind of belt drive system. Used to, they would mount the alternator on a bracket where you could swivel it. And you'll notice on older cars, mostly like from 1988 and back, that this mounting bolt for the alternator will have like a leg sticking off of it that's a big slot that you can pivot the alternator onto that bracket and it tightens up this belt. So when your belt's loose, you come out with a pry bar and pry your alternator with the bolt loose and then snug the bolt up. This is a much better way of doing things. You can actually go like this right here, push it over and pull the belt off with your hand. And to get it back on, you stick a wrench in here. That you, in nine out of 10 times, that's gonna be a 3 8 drive off of a ratchet fits right in there. That's something they do on purpose, just to make things easier. So, um, moving downward a little bit, you'll see the bottom pulley right there. This is the very bottom, Sorry. right there. That is the end of your crankshaft. Your crankshaft runs through the motor. It attaches to your pistons via something they call a connecting rod, and it spins around. And as the fuel comes to combustion, it pushes and forces that to spin. So that is what drives all of the belt and everything. On the other side, I'm gonna step around there too real quick. How about this thing here? It's got a reservoir tank on it, and then it's got a pulley on the front. Power steering. Pulling engine. Yeah, power steering. And if you look at it, it also has, right there you'll see this line that runs into it. That's where your power steering fluid goes into it. And you always check it. When it comes to checking stuff under a hood, it's kind of good that we landed on this. So you'll notice on this stick right here, it says- it Smells good. Full cold, it's actually upside down. But right there it says full cold. And then on the other side, you'll normally see full hot. So whenever you check it, you can check it both ways. I prefer to check that when it's hot because it's working and you see what's going on. And plus when it's running, if you've got a leak or something, it's easier to find it when it's running. Um, then of course your engine oil, that's like the most paramount important thing on an engine. I mean, you can have no air conditioner, you can have a weak battery, you can have whatever you want, but if there's not oil in it, like you're on the side of the road, you always wanna let your car sit for at least five minutes or so before you check the oil. Like a lot of people, oh, it needs oil in it, and then they like crank up the car, run to the store, and get a cork real quick and put it in, and your oil level level's actually different because that big, huge motor right there, oil runs through little bitty tubes inside of it to get to different places. And the oil sticks to stuff to lubricate it. And it takes it a while to run back off and get to the bottom of the motor. Um, How long does it usually take? About, about three to five minutes mm -hmm. if, if the engine is hot. Now, if it's like a cold day and you just crank up your motor for a minute or two and run it for like five minutes, you need to let it sit for like 10 to 15 minutes for it to roll back because the oil's gonna act a lot like uh, pancake syrup. You know, you go to Waffle House or whatever and they bring the syrup out and it's hot and it comes out almost like water, but if it's at room temperature, it comes out like wood glue. That's kind of how oil does. And speaking of that, when it comes to engine oil, like this right here tells us that we're supposed to use 5W30 oil. Does anybody know what that number actually means on the oil? 5W30.
weight? Yes. And what that weight is, is that that's two different ratings. That's one chemical with two ratings on it. That 5W, the W stands for winter. What's something about winter that sticks out like a sore thumb? Cold. It's cold, right? So when the oil is cold, it has the lubricity and it can move at a five weight viscosity. Viscosity is like, water is low viscosity, right? It runs, it flows really easy. Like pancake syrup, when it's cold, it's high viscosity because what? It flows very slowly. So if you can think about starting up your motor and it not having any oil, the lower this W number is, the quicker your engine is gonna get lubricated at startup. All right, and this 30 has to do with the protection quality of the oil. It protects as well as back in the day before we had mixed oil, you either had 20 weight or 30 weight or 50 weight. You can still buy 30 weight. It goes in, everybody's lawnmower runs it. That's what we use to uh, change the oil in our lawnmower up here. Um, but that's the protection of the oil. If you'll notice, the oil that we have to go in here is a 10W40. It has a higher protection and it has a little bit thicker of a base to it than the five. But this vehicle also has 400,000 miles on it. That's really cool. We ought to look at the odometer if anybody doubts it. This thing is nearly half a million miles. And uh, well, as things get old and worn in, a little bit thicker oil sometimes helps. Usually if a car is less than 10 years old, you want to put exactly what it says to put in it. And one thing that, let me kind of like take some myth out of this. People are going to tell you, oh man, Valvoline is the greatest oil. And then like you meet somebody else and it's like Castrol is the greatest oil. And all the time I've spent working on cars, the most important thing is that you put oil in it, keep the oil to its level. And if possible, don't change brands because they put different chemicals in your engine oil now. Like we were talking about starting up the engine, all right, and how long it takes for the oil to get to it. When you shut this off and it sits overnight and all the oil falls off of the inside, when you start it up in the morning, some vehicles start up and it's like, and then it's like kind of a rough, it runs really rough, kind of shakes a little bit. Well, what that is, is there's no oil on anything and it's called dry start. Well, years ago, they used to put zinc, which anybody knows that firearms require zinc. It's a soft white metal is all it is. And it makes like a film and in older engines that have an old school cam that's a flat tappet, newer ones have roller cams. The zinc would protect your crankshaft and everything when you start it up. They took that out. It, it was shown to, uh, I, I really disagree with why they took it out. They said that catalytic converter life was influenced by up to 10% by having zinc in the oil. And I just really, not only question that number, but uh, wouldn't you rather have a 500,000 mile vehicle than to have one that makes it like 80,000 and you're ready for a new motor? So they've taken that out and moved over to that newer concept we were talking about how, you know, they rely on lower weight of oil now to supply the lubricity at startup. Some of the other things, there are some additives that go in there. Some use uh, PTFE. You'll see it sold as Grease Lightning. You'll also see a black bottle that just says PTFE. And it's uh, a bonus question for the day. Does anybody know what PTFE stands for? It's polytetrafluoroethane. <laughs> I don't know why I know that. It's a completely dorky term. But what it is, is it's basically um, you take refrigerant, the same refrigerant that goes into an air conditioner, and you run it through electrolysis, and it makes this really slick, really smooth, almost plastic material. Well, you don't get dry start when that's in your oil, because after the oil falls off, 
the little grains of that stuff are stuck in there to your crankshaft and your bearings and everything. Keeps it lubed up. I know that seems like a lot of talk about oil, but that is the most important thing in a car, truck, mower, anything that runs on a gas engine or diesel engine also. There are some other parts here that are kind of important. We looked at the fan earlier. The fan goes to the radiator. You can see the radiator is on that little screen looking thing there. Um, you'll notice the fan has a nice little looking round thing on it here. It's called a clutch, fan clutch. This shaft spins no matter what. It's always spinning when the motor runs. It's always spinning. But there's a thermostat in here. And all a thermostat is is a piece of metal that's sitting straight. And when it heats up, it bends they put one metal on one side one metal on the other and one metal does not expand at heat and the other one does so it gives it like a rainbow effect it bends it what that causes is when that little piece moves over that clutch locks in to the fan if you've noticed really poor gas mileage and your vehicle has a fan clutch you may need to look at your fan clutch. How you can normally test them is come out here and you see how this fan, I can turn it and it doesn't keep turning. That means that the fan clutch is working right. If I were to take it and spin it and it just kept on spinning, then it would be time to replace that fan clutch. In other words, the theory there is, hey, if you're pushing the horsepower that that fan takes to turn, you're wasting power that would have went to your wheels. Okay. Yeah, go right ahead. And that's, that's what a, a good fan clutch feels like. We, it may feel different on the other vehicle over there because it's, I, I may, I haven't even looked at that one. And so we've already seen the most important thing about keeping a car running is the engine oil. Well, the one thing on a car that can kill you no matter what is if it doesn't stop correctly. I mean, go and stop. That's the two things a car has to do. So this is your master cylinder. This is the reservoir that holds the brake fluid. And that's the actual part that does it. There's a little plunger in here. And when you push your brake pedal, the hydraulic force this is basically just a dead hydraulic pump is all it is. When you push it, it pumps fluid down to your brakes through these lines right here that you see, the metal lines that come off of it. Those go down to your wheels, and that's where you have the other component of the hydraulic system. You've got basically a little hunk of metal with a hole in it, and it's got a piece of rubber in the middle, and a piece of rubber slides. When you put pressure on this, it causes that to move. That's what stops your car. And anytime you're messing with one, if somebody doesn't mind, grab one of those microfiber cloths real quick. So any hydraulic system kind of has the same rule to it. Any kind of dust or dirt or contamination or debris inside of a hydraulic system will cause it to fail at some point along the line. So if you're gonna open it up and check the fluid level, you definitely need to clean it off real good first. Actually, if you don't mind, can you hold that camera right there? When you're taking these off, you wanna keep down pressure on it because you notice it can move like that. Well, you can rip it loose right here where the metal comes into the plastic or you can break the plastic if you're not careful. You wanna keep some down pressure on it and pull these tabs up. And then you're left with this little doohickey right here. And it usually has some funky little thing like that and you have to fix it. And you just look in there and see where your brake fluid level is. You see how that's kind of dirty looking? It wouldn't hurt to flush that really soon. We can do it today. We don't really have time to flush it today. Basically you pull loose your brakes and you pump your pedal until the brake fluid down by the, by the brake comes out into like a jug and then you just continually put new fluid in here. But it's real important to put this back together right. If there's air leaking through this, your brakes won't work because 
the pressure that's applied to that fluid is now leaking out of this. That's why this is all made out of a special rubber that doesn't swell up or get old. And you always wanna put it on that cap and make sure it fits down on that cap before you put it on. And when you put it on, you, you don't wanna go like one side at a time or anything like that. You wanna just even pressure all the way down and smash it. The part that drives it is what it comes out of. You'll notice it comes into this right here called a brake booster. What this little guy does is there is a vacuum hose right here that runs into the back of your carburetor or fuel injection, or if, if you're on a fully fuel injected car, it'll just run into your manifold. Because basically if air is sucking through here, being pulled through here, it creates vacuum. So that vacuum is transferred over here to this booster and it holds vacuum. That air pressure is what you feel when you hit your brake pedal. If you have ever driven an old car or a tractor or something like that that has mechanical brakes, it's just a lever. This uses pneumatic force. Where this uses hydraulic, this uses pneumatic force. In science, they'll tell you the, the same thing applies to both. If, if any of this comes under pressure, then all parts of the system are under pressure. And the same thing is, is true about air systems. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about air pressure or vacuum. Vacuum is just basically like you're sucking on a straw. You created a vacuum. So that's some of the basic parts of the car. We've seen the air box over there. Oh yeah, let's look at the um, the dirty computer here. That will get all your information. Yeah, that, that's where your fuel injection talks to this to figure out what it's doing. If you're having like real bad problems, most people that have electrical problems on their car, oh, my car was in a flash flood and it never ran right since. Nine times out of 10, the connection on your car that's janky or screwed up is gonna be one of these right here to your computer. So that's worth pointing out. Somebody has a car for sale on like Craigslist for 500 bucks and it's been in water damage. All right, and you'd be surprised at the amount of people that do not know that is the first place you look. When you pull them apart, different ones are different, but you'll find that there are about 30 to 40 contacts in that one. And there's about 15 in here and somewhere between 20 and 30 more right here. And what you wanna do is pull them out spray them with that contact cleaner that we were using the other day to get all the dirt and trash off of them and plug them back in and now all your water's gone and nine times out of ten that summarizes your flood damage to a car because that is its brain you're, you're frying its brain when it gets wet the other thing is like on radiators um, you'll notice over here by the battery is the cap for the radiator right here and once again you can see the radiator right through here and most cars the radiator is right here and the air conditioner coil is right up here too so if you're ever driving and your car is overheating turn your air off because that opens up for more airflow to your radiator so most cars now have two different types of reservoirs for the radiator like one, you can always check it right here. If the engine is cold, if the engine's hot, you don't want to check it right here. Notice how there's a little bit of goop built up right here. This particular vehicle has, um, well, kind of a factory defect. The heads, which are covered up by the valve cover right there, the heads are aluminum and the block is iron. Well, things expand and contract when they get hot and cold, right? Well, aluminum and cast iron expand and contract at a different rate. So the gasket that goes between there called the head gasket, well, it has a tendency to leak a little bit. The piston. And so we put stop leak. Anytime you see one of these GM vehicles like this, they just, they have a different, and even the ones that don't have aluminum heads, they have a different uh, alloy. Of, of cast for the heads and they simply expand and contract at a different rate. 
Some of them also have a plastic intake gasket. Well, the plastic doesn't expand and contract. It's more like a fiberglass. Um, Is the head and the piston the same thing? No, the piston comes up beneath the head. If you were to look right here, if you took this off, you would have what's called a rocker arm right there, and there would be a spring that kept it shut, and then your cam comes around. It, a lot of people call a cam a bump stick because it's got little bumps on it. And when it comes around, it moves and a crack. push rod, and that push rod moves that rocker arm to go up and down, and that spring causes it to return. So that's another big part of the engine breathing. We're gonna look at some of those pictures expanded here probably over the next week or two and kind of more of the internal parts of the engine. Um, of course, now the antifreeze runs all through the block, the intake manifold and everything. You need to clean this off. Yeah, it's always a good idea to wipe that off maybe with a rag or something. But what that actually you is. Can I do it right now? Yeah, yeah, that's totally fine. What that is, is you'll notice this looks a whole lot like rust, but it's not because the stop leak we put in there is making that. When you look at the antifreeze you want to see that it's either orange or green i prefer the green antifreeze because rust and stuff shows up it'll start looking brown or goopy or gunky you know but if you have a car that runs on the orange antifreeze or the yellow antifreeze if you're going to change it to this you've got to go to walmart buy some deionized water and run it through there for about a day and then change it or get all season, all vehicle antifreeze that fits in anything and it's kind of green. But that goes basically that pumps through the motor. It's gonna come out of this hose over here. You see where that bolts to the radiator? And it just comes right over here and boom, it dumps right in the top of the engine. Your thermostat sits right there. If your car is overheating, stuff like that nine times out of ten the thermostat is going to be the problem and you just it's really simple you you take off this bolt and you take off this bolt and you pull the thing off and there's a little thermostat sitting under there um, another problem that happens that people don't think about when you replace one well when you pull that hose out of the way and the water drains out of that hose well now you've got nothing but air in that hose all right so if you can imagine walking up to a stove and there are two pots on the stove and both of them are turned on high, right? One of them's full of water, one of them's full of air. Which one would you stick your hand in? The air. The air, that's right. Water. Air doesn't transfer heat. So if you have air in this hose right here, a lot of times that is why your thermostat is not working. So that's something to kind of keep in mind when, when you have one that's, you know, you can always, when the car is running, you should be able to come right here and squeeze on it. And you should be able to feel hot water right here. It should feel hot. You can also, if you look right here, as I squeeze on it, you see the water level raise right here. That will let you know that it's not full of air because air compresses easier than fluid. Fluid so, does not compress at all. So if it has, is it leaking if it has hot air? If it has hot air right there, what's happened is there's a leak somewhere in the system and the fluid level came down and you just haven't found the leak yet. A lot of times the leak is coming out of your tailpipe through your intake. Is that the back there? Yeah. A lot of times it just comes out of steam. It'll look white. And usually the engine kind of stumbles really easily when you're burning antifreeze like that. And that's the reservoir. You'll notice that down here you have um, antifreeze in there. And you've got a little mark right there that says full hot and full cold. Well, right now it's cold and I'm to that line. So that's good. All right, so this is like your old school reservoir system. All your cars before like 1990 or about 1977. Built like that, built just like this totally you have a radiator and a reservoir modern cars sometimes what they do is instead of having this cap the way that this is it'll be sealed right here and they'll have a pressurized cap right here on the reservoir so 
on a lot of newer cars, you can't go to the radiator at all and check it. You have to go over here and just trust that everything up here is okay. I prefer the older system on these for something I'm just gonna drive around and beat around in or work on. It's a lot more straightforward to diagnose. The other thing that kind of keeps you going down the road, transmission fluid, that's always important to check. You always want to check that with the, the motor warmed up and hot and running. So do you want to do that today? Basically everything you check on a car falls in two categories, stuff you check hot, stuff you check cold. If it's cold, by all means, check the radiator and the engine oil. And then if it's hot, you want to check transmission fluid, power steering fluid, stuff like that. Your brake fluid can happen when it's off it really doesn't matter and it's worth mentioning you can normally stand back like from this camera angle you can really see it you can see the fluid level in there pretty easy sometimes being right up there on it and looking at it you can't see it as well as you can just backing off so that's just kind of some under the hood basics so next we're going to move we're going to start taking air filters out doing a little bit of service and uh, drain the oil on this one and crack loose the fuel filter on that other one.